and welcome to this final session of day three of the Klingendal Institute's State of the European Union Conference. My name is Rem Kortevich. I'm a senior research fellow at the Klingendal Institute, and I'm uh, honored to moderate this session on the EU in the new global reality after the US elections. As I'm sure everyone knows, um, or actually, if you're not watching this, you're probably watching the, uh, the US election results. But I hope uh, all of you are going to stay with us um, for the next hour as we try to make sense of what the US elections also mean for uh, European foreign policy, for the future of the European Union. And to do that, uh, I'm joined by a fantastic panel of experts who I'm going to introduce to you just now. First of all, in alphabetical order, uh, by, um, I'm joined by Eric Bratberg from Washington, DC. A very warm welcome to you, Eric. Um, I don't know how much sleep you got, but uh, you, look, uh, you look bright and shiny, that's, that's super. Eric is the director of the Europe Program and fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Fantastic that you could join. We're also joined by Steve Erlanger, um, the chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times. Great to see you again, Steve. Then um, we're joined by Lise Grégoire van Haren. She is the EU director at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A very warm welcome to you, Lise. And then two of my colleagues, on the one hand, Louise van Schaik, Dr. Louise van Schaik, who is the head of unit of our EU and global affairs team. And uh, my co-host for this afternoon is Brigitte Decker, junior researcher at the Klingendal Institute. Again, great that you can join. Now, um, Steve, I'm going to start with you first, because I know that you're on a bit of a tight leash. You have to uh, do some important New York Times stuff in uh, in half an hour. But um, I want to take this opportunity and ask, actually ask you to bring us up to speed. There's still a lot uncertain about these elections. We're all waiting for the results to come in. It seems like with the mail-in votes, things might be changing in a number of key states. What can we say with some degree of certainty also in terms of its impact on the transatlantic relationship? Steve. Well, I would first say as an American, our whole intention is to entertain you for days <laughs> on end, which we've been trying to do. Um, it is a very narrow path um, in a very complicated electoral system, but the turnout people think has been the largest as a percentage since 1900, so in more than 100 years. Joe Biden probably will win 70 million votes, which will be more than any other single person has ever won nationwide. But of course, that's irrelevant because of the Electoral College. It's, uh, it looks now as if Biden is likely to win a narrow majority and become the next president but it, it really is too early to tell. Um, the famous red mirage seems to have been true in these battleground states. Republican totals, many Republicans vote in person, looked high to begin with, but they've been shrinking over time as mail-in ballots have been counted. And then there's some states, key states like Pennsylvania, where they're not allowed to start counting until the polls close even, um, even uh, mail-in votes, but it, it looks very, very close. It looks now that Biden is probably gonna take Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona. Um, it may mean that he doesn't need Pennsylvania, but um, at this moment, that's where I would put my 22 cents. That's about all I've got. Mm. Um, but I'm trying to be careful. The other important thing that happened is the Democratic hopes to win the Senate back from the Republicans, I don't believe are going to be fulfilled. Uh, Republicans also turned out in huge numbers. A lot of key battleground states um, went Republican. At this point, you know, each party has flipped one Senate seat but um, with a, a lot more to play for. The big question, of course, is with a divided government, if that's what we end up with, 
what can Biden get done? Um, what does this mean for the Democratic Party going forward? This is not the outcome they were hoping for. If they win the presidency, that's good. That's better than bad. Um, and what will it say to the Republican Party, which has actually done very well among working class Americans? Trump actually increased his support among blacks, among women, um, partly because of the big turnout. But a lot of assumptions made by Democrats, if you remember Joe Biden said blacks who vote for Trump ain't black. Well, maybe he was wrong about that. And Latinos seem to have voted in large numbers for Donald Trump, partly because they're becoming more middle class, but also particularly in Florida. Uh, I think Trump's policies on Cuba and Venezuela, though they've been a failure, were very popular with Latin American voters in the South, especially. So, you know, there's a lot to play for. We're beginning to come to an end. It may not come to an end until Friday. Then we may have recount suggestions and court cases. And Trump, if he loses, might have to be washed out of the White House with a hose. But we'll see. That's all to come. Right. Right. And, and I mean, th thanks. Thanks for that. And I'll, I'll come back to you in a second to get your um, um, to get your sense of how Europeans have been responding. I mean, what you've what you've heard from uh, from say Paris or, or or Berlin so far, but I want to bring in Eric. Um, I mean, you're you're in Washington. I'm, I'm curious about your uh, impressions over the past 24 hours, but particularly also something that Steve mentioned: this divided government. Can you explain to our audience what that could imply in terms of transatlantic engagement, for instance, on on trade issues in the, in the future, Eric? Sure. Well, thanks so much, Rem, and great to be with everyone. Thanks to a lot of espresso, I'm still <laughs> up and running. Um, I, I completely agree with Steve's analysis, and we have to wait and see how this is going to play out. But the possibility is that you could end up with a divided government where uh, Republicans keep control of the Senate, Democrats keep control of the House, and then the presidency can go either way. And of course, for foreign policy, um, you know, this is an area where traditionally uh, president does have a lot of uh, power, he can use executive actions. We've certainly seen uh, President Trump do that quite a lot. Um, I do think if Biden eventually ekes out a victory, which I think is still possible, uh, what it means, I think, is that he will preside over a country that is extremely divided. Um, this sort of notion that there would be a big blue wave, that there would be a repudiation of Trumpism would not have come about, even if he ends up winning. Um, and I think it means that for you know, at least the beginning of his term, but probably throughout the entire term, he would have to be focused on domestic issues, trying to heal the wounds, trying to bring the country together and try to deal with the divisions in American society. That's gonna be his main task. Um, and assuming, which is likely that the Republicans keeps the Senate, that's gonna make his domestic agenda even more difficult. I mean, he promised investments in climate, he promised investments in infrastructure, in healthcare, you know, um, raising the minimum wage and so on and so forth. Uh, there's not gonna be support um, for, uh, you know, far reaching, uh, uh, transformational change in the U.S. Senate. So that means that his domestic agenda will be even more complicated. And what I think the takeaway for Europeans is, you know, they should realize that that even a Biden administration, the notion that Biden could come to Europe, and we heard that uh, previously in his Munich uh, security conference address that he would he would say that, you know, United States is back, Trump was a temporary thing. Well, hold on a minute. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't just a blip. Maybe Trumpism in America is still, you know, alive and kicking, even if Biden wins. Um, so I think the notion that, you know, uh, things can simply revert back to normal um, is, is quite unlikely. And I think you would have to see a more humble American leadership and more foreign policy towards Europe. And, and I think it will reinforce uh, those capitals around Europe that are already quite skeptical of the reliability of the United States, in particular Paris, um, that even if Biden wins, that, there won't, that this sort of trajectory of, 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 of US foreign policy will not change, even if Biden puts on, puts on a nicer face. Uh, specifically on, on trade, I think it, it does mean that, you know, um, you know, Biden was quite unlikely to, to pursue uh, any wide ranging free trade agenda anyway. If anything, I think one of the lasting effects of Trump is that this sort of protectionist economic nationalist um, approach will continue. 
um, and Biden has actually adopted quite an sort of economic nationalist domestic agenda well, as well with industrial policy, with sort of buy America. So I think a, a lot of that would actually continue even if Biden is elected. Um, and, and I don't think we should put a lot of hopes either way, whether it's Trump or Biden, that there would be any significant changes on, on trade policy after this election. Right. Yeah. Th thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Steve, as I mentioned, I mean, could you, um, what did you find remarkable so far or noteworthy from, from European politicians, even though I, I expect many will take a quite measured approach? I, for instance, I was struck by a comment by Norbert Rutgen, who, who is, of course, one of the potential um, successors of Angela Merkel in the in, in in Germany's CDU party, he he was very outspoken about what a potential second Trump administration would mean for Germany and transatlantic relations. Um, did, what what have you heard or picked up so far from from Europeans about what's what's happening? And after that, I want to bring in Lisa to give a to give a Dutch per, uh, perspective. Steve, I'll try to be brief. I mean, I think through their tears. Europeans are trying to say, um, we'll work with whoever we get. The United States is kind of the indispensable nation still, and um, everyone will try to make the best of it. I think if Trump is gone, people will be very relieved, no matter what else happens, um, because the tone will be better. He'll rejoin the Paris Accord, which we left formally yesterday. He'll rejoin the WHO, he'll pay UNRWA, he'll do all these things that uh, America traditionally does. But I think, you know, the Europeans also will see a divided country, uh, will see a Senate that is blocking legislation, though in the next midterms, that could change again. Um, they'll see a friendly face, one that encourages European integration and unity rather than Mr. Trump who wanted to break it apart, who didn't understand the European Union. I think pressure for defense spending will continue. Um, there'll be an effort, Biden's already talked about a kind of dialogue of, of, um, of democracies. Um, I think there'll be more pressure to come up with some sort of joint positioning on China, which may be very awkward for many Europeans, and I think we shouldn't forget Central Europeans, Eastern Europeans, I think will be very disappointed. They have trusted Trump. Trump's done very well for them. He's put American troops in their countries to help deterrence. Biden won't take them away, but there, there will just be this feeling that um, Biden isn't quite as strong, perhaps, as Trump has been, despite his rhetoric, um, against Russia. But we'll have to see. In terms of trade, I agree with Eric. I mean, uh, Biden is like the last romantic transatlanticist, but he's also a Democrat. And Democrats are not kind of big on free trade. There's a protectionist mood. Um, we'll see what happens. But um, Biden will concentrate, first of all, I think, on domestic matters with the virus and the economy. And I think Europeans shouldn't expect too much from him in the beginning, except nice words and pats on the head and say, you know, they're there, it'll all be a bit better. Mm. Th thanks. And, uh, but perhaps Europe is also going to be increasingly focused on its domestic matters. Um, that's a, sort of a segue to bring Lisa into the discussion, but not before I remind um, all the participants that you can ask your questions uh, in the Q&A function below. Uh, please do so and we'll try to bring you in uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but Lisa, um, listening to this, uh, Eric mentioned we should expect a more humble US president. Um, there's continued division uh, to be expected inside US politics, a more introspective United States. Um, what does that look like from your vantage point? I mean, recognizing that you focus mostly on internal EU affairs, but does that factor into the internal EU calculus, you think? Well, thank you, Raymond, and thank you also for inviting me in this discussion. And having lived in the US for a few years, uh, when I was working as an ambassador to the UN, um, of course, I was, I'm very intrigued and I follow the US uh, election very closely and I won't comment on that, but 
I think there is a lot to be, I mean, also listening to, to, to Steve and Eric, uh, I expect a lot of continuity uh, from regardless the outcome of the elections. So I, I think if you look at the longer lines, there is a shift in focus when it comes to foreign policy um, in the US and it's more focused on China and strategic interests there. Um, so I expect, uh, like what Steve said, a, a difference in tone of voice, and I also expect different levels of cooperation uh, in multilateral fora and, and bigger global issues. Um, so I think that that's where the main differences lie. But when you look at and our strategic interests won't change that much either. So there is a lot of continuity there as well. Uh, because we need a good relationship with the US. Uh, we need it for security reasons, for trade purposes, we, and we need it also to safeguard our freedoms. Uh, when you look at multilateral fora, where we need to work together uh, to withstand uh, pressure on, on those freedoms. What Minister Bloch said on Monday, when in the opening session of this, uh, this forum, um, we want to be a player and not a playing field. We don't want the rivalry between the US and China to be played out at the, at the European field. Um, so um, in the end, it is a question. I mean, when we look at the US elections, and maybe it's a big leap, but in the end, it is about competitiveness uh, of the European Union, about who sets the standards in the world and who works, works with whom. Um, so, that is also the reason why my minister not only focused on the geopolitical questions, but also on uh, convergence within the European Union, making sure that we work together to reach the highest possible competitiveness levels, um, linking that to the geopolitical factor, because you can only be a strong uh, if you have strong, strong member states. Uh, and the third element was a rules-based system. And this is something we also put in the geo, uh, in, in the, um, in 2016, as a European Union, Union, we said our primary goal is to re reach a, a rules-based global order. We don't only need that at, at a global level, but we also need it within the European Union to make sure uh, that we, we stay together, we stick together, that there is mutual trust. Um, and this is something we need to work on, especially now, if we are more and more responsible for our own uh, security. So this means we have to invest in our diplomatic clout as well. If we want to be a player, um, you need to do several things. I can elaborate on that later, maybe if you like, but, um, uh, but the main message is that I think that what we are seeing in the US uh, today in the elections um, is, is not a big shift in a way, or, and I don't think Trump was a temporary thing. So when you look at the longer lines, um, I think the, the European Union has to prepare to stand more at its own feet and work very closely. I mean, try to make this partnership with the US as strong as we can, uh, but at the same time also taking our own responsibilities. Right. And, that's, and that's the sort of the, the EU strategic autonomy concept, um, I take it. Uh, Louisa, I know that you've been working on this. I know that you're also preparing a, a paper on the future of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, you're working on the health security file. I mean, when we think about st European strategic autonomy, also perhaps in the context of either a second Trump administration or a somewhat handicapped Biden administration, I mean, what are the, what are the priority fields you're, you're, you're thinking about? Yeah, well, I agree with the other speakers. It's probably going to be more EU first. That's what we're going to see more. We're going to see more European industrial policy. We're going to see perhaps a more French-like uh, EU. Um, we're going to see uh, also more of the EU uh, looking at international institutions uh, from its interests. Uh, but also from a perspective of whether we want to save an international institution, so with Trump pulling out of the World Health Organization, Germany chipping in with 500 million, um, uh, Europe being more conscious about what the international order uh, brings to it, uh, Europe still being the biggest economy in the world, um, uh, trying perhaps, uh, becoming perhaps a bit more strategic about this, being the biggest development donor, um, 
Um, I think a lot of the trust in the U.S. and in the U.S. society and also the feeling of, um, of, of, of the bond between the societies has eroded. Uh, so that will also influence whether we will buy uh, U.S. military equipment, uh, uh, how we're going to position ourselves in a digital competition between the U.S. and China. I think definitely with Biden, we will be much more open for cooperation with the US and we will also uh, uh, collaborate more. Uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased indeed that uh, it, it looks better on the field of vaccine cooperation, climate change uh, and so on and so forth if Biden becomes the, the president. Uh, but I think the EU will be much more on its guards uh, to secure that it has own productions own digital capacities in, in a few years time. Um, and, 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 and this lack of trust, <laughs> that's not going to be back, you know, overnight. I think that's the most important point. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I, uh, I, I think I agree with you on that. Um, we have some questions coming in. Uh, Brigitte, could you um, pick one? Yes, thank you, Rem. Um, first of all, of course, a big thank you to all the panelists already. Uh, your answers already led to many follow-up questions in the Q&A. Um, I think I will start with a question for Stephen, because I believe you have to leave a little bit earlier. Um, and it's one about, um, about the elections um, from Ruth, uh, Ruth Kasperi. Um, in case Biden wins, maybe the U.S. policy will not change that much, but isn't it already important that the tone will be a bit more civilized? What do you think, Stephen? <laughs> well, I, I think tone matters. I, I mean, being nice to people rather than yelling at them matters, thinking of them as friends and allies rather than foes and, and rivals matters a lot, right? Um, also, I want to compliment Rem on his necktie, which is hanging behind him. It's very apposite. Um, but I do think it is true, as Lise said, and Louise, there is structural change in the United States. I mean, demographically, the, the United States has changed. The Democratic Party has changed. The Republican Party may be seeing itself more as an identitarian working class party rather than an elite party, which is quite interesting. The metropolitan elites seem to be democratic these days. Um, so things are shifting. Americans do have responded to Trump's complaints that its allies are free riders, that they're not doing enough for themselves, um, that they're not spending enough that they're taking advantage of Washington's military presence and so on. Um, and I think this will continue and Biden will probably respond to it. Also, the thing to remember about Biden is um, he's not Hillary Clinton. I mean, he was against the surge in Afghanistan. He was against going after Osama bin Laden at that moment. He thought it was a bit too dangerous. He was against the Libyan intervention. He, he's not the same aggressive person. Um, and I think he will continue to try to end the so-called forever wars and will hope that Europe will actually do more um, in its own field um, and, and take more responsibility. I don't think Americans want, have any opposition to that. They just think NATO needs to be preserved. And I think inside Europe, if Europe is going to keep the Central Europeans on board, that has to be important. Even Macron says that over and over again, though I'm not sure everyone believes him, but that's what he says. And, and Lisa, to this point, this idea of, well, the distinction between Biden and Trump might not be that large, but at least it's a difference in tone. Um, among at least among the six of us, but perhaps among many more, you are um, very experienced in, in, in the art of diplomacy. You've been based in New York at the United Nations. I mean, can you inform us how important is tone in, in diplomacy in the day-to-day -day dealings in the transatlantic relationship? 
Well, maybe a small anecdote just comes to mind. And that is uh, when I, I mean, I, I've always done EU things. And when I ended up in the UN, uh, I had all of a sudden had to do business with countries that were not as friendly as the friends we have in the European Union. And then somebody said to me, um, don't worry, Lisa, it's, all, it's never personal. And that for me was a big relief because I could very clearly separate the personal from, from the business. In the end, especially in the Security Council, I noticed um, very sharply that sometimes it is, it is very personal. It is very personal. So it is about giving and, and, um, and, and it's also about trusting somebody personally to do the right thing with what, what you would like to do. Uh, so in the end, I think, uh, and that is also the key of diplomacy, it is about building personal relationships to move a bigger agenda. Uh, so it, um, I came to the conclusion that the first advice that gave me a lot of comfort <laughs> in the beginning was actually uh, not the right advice. I, I think it is always personal. And this is also between leaders and this is also between diplomats and between countries. And, friend, uh, and friendship or like a personal relation and also wanting to grant something to the other uh, is about, it is about tone, tone of voice and it's about giving something to the other and then somebody gives you something in return just because you did each other a favor, for example. So it is very much about building uh, relationships and of course tone of voice matters in that. And make no mistake, I mean, it's not only about the tone of voice, it's also about very clear cut, hard national interest. Um, and everybody knows that, so there's no secret because everybody defends their national interests. Um, so you can sometimes play it hard, but in the end, if you want to progress, um, it is useful to have good personal relationship and, and, and have good relationships at a, at a national level. And they follow the same principles, basically. Um, so I think tone of voice in that regard make it easier to build something together and, and sometimes run something to the other. Uh, so it, it is easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Um, I think before we have to say goodbye to Steve, I want to squeeze in one more question on, on European external action and, and the transatlantic relationship. Um, so Brigitte, over to you. Yes. Um, I think one question that really uh, fits into the debate we now having is uh, the U.S. leadership. Um, a question from Jan Willem van der Vossen. Uh, U.S. leadership has traditionally and simplifying somewhat been strongly associated with military leadership. Um, this role can probably be uh, not be played by the EU uh, for quite a while at least. Uh, should we start to make a distinction between military leadership and civil leadership? And could the EU take a more prominent and legitimate role in this latter area? And I also want to get Eric's views on this uh, in a second. Yes. But Steve, over to you. Well, first. yes. I mean, I, I would love Europe to step up in lots of different directions. I don't expect... I'm not even sure there's a European foreign policy that you can call a European foreign policy. I mean, let's be honest, except on the lowest common denominator three weeks to get sanctions on Belarus was a scandal, for instance, and that was simple. So I'm not looking for a European army. I don't expect one. I mean, that would require a European commander and someone who'd be in political charge. It's just way down the road. But I do see Europe doing more. It'd be nice to get an asylum policy that is coherent inside Europe. That would be in Europe's own interests, given North Africa. I would love to see more coordination on questions of migration. More, I mean, climate is going pretty well. Um, European leadership is very important on that issue. I think European regulation is very important on this new digital world, but I fear that it is in danger of, of suppressing innovation inside Europe rather than inspiring it. So the advantage of the chaos of America is that things happen and we worry about regulating them later. In Europe, people tend to regulate things before they happen, which uh, rather in intimidates people. Um, but I do think on 5G, there's room for European initiative. I mean, you did Airbus. I'm not sure why you can't do 5G as a sort of European project, for example. So 
I am looking for European moral leadership. It would be important on issues of Hong Kong, on the Uyghurs, on Ukraine, on Belarus, on, on sort of many, many things. I encourage it. I'm not always expecting it, but I would be very happy to see it. And with that, I'm really sorry, but I wish you all all the best. Thank you for your patience, Rem, and uh, alles Gute to everybody. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Take care. So, I'm sorry to leave. <laughs> all right, but we're just going to go continue. Um, Eric, I, I want to get your views on um, somewhat paraphrasing Mr. van der Vossen's question is, what are the areas where Europe can be a strategically autonomous, where it want, really should be strategically autonomous? And should Europe expect, I, I, what, what does that mean for, for Europe's more um, hard security identity? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think, I mean, regardless of the election, as we talked about initially, I do think this notion that Europe needs to stand more on its own two feet, take more responsibility, uh, that will be um, the approach going forward. Question is, you know, in, in to what extent, right? And I think if Trump is elected, I think you will really see uh, at least some capitals around Europe doubling down. If it's Biden, I think we will continue in that direction, but there will still be a sense that we really need to sort of hold on to, to the transatlantic relationship. I think areas where I, I, you know, I agree with Steve very much. I think areas where the EU has really stepped up in recent years is not necessarily only in security and defense where we have seen some new initiatives, but frankly, things like PESCO European Defense Fund, they're very long-term. They're unlikely to, to lead to any transformative change in, in Europe's ability to sort of assume more uh, responsibilities over at least sort of the, the more hardcore defense areas, which remain, you know, uh, areas where NATO is really the bedrock of transatlantic security. Um, I do think the EU could and will have to uh, take on more responsibility for security issues in its neighborhood. Uh, and there, you know, the outcome of the US election, as Steve mentioned, will not have a significant impact. Um, even Biden will not be particularly keen on intervening in, in you know, North Africa. Uh, and so forth. So that's an area where, where Europe will have to do more. It could be for the EU, but it could also be for some of these other formats. I mean, France has created a European intervention force. Uh, there's other platforms around there that are more ad hoc that you can use um, that may be actually be more appropriate for, for those type of military operations. Aside from the security and the defense field, I actually see the EU being able to do much more in terms of strategic autonomy when it comes to areas that are more economic or geoeconomic trade, technology, supply chains. I think these are areas that certainly the European Commission has more competencies on. Um, it's, it's easier maybe to build consensus around the member states. Um, it's, it's less sort of divisive. Um, and that's where I could see, you know, we have seen initiatives in, in recent years on doing more, um, you know, and I, I could definitely see uh, more on that front uh, going forward as well. Uh, certainly uh, this has to do with, you know, Europe wanting to protect itself from, from unfair Chinese competition, which is an issue where, where there is growing concerns around European capitals, strengthening Europe's ability to control investment, strengthening its, its export control uh, regulations, um, stepping up its, its global trade role, which we've seen a lot of progress on under the Trump administration as the US has retrenched from that role. Um, but I think what we, what we need to have also is um, you know, we need to balance, I think, this notion, this focus on autonomy and sovereignty with a more forward-leaning and assertive approach. And that's why I really agree with Lisa that what Europe should not do is to sort of build, erect walls around itself and, and try to think that you could just, you know, um, um, hunker down. You really need to engage internationally. You need to work with like-minded partners. Um, be it Japan, being Australia, be it Canada, uh, really engage in the multilateral level and really work on reforming uh, and reinventing multilateral institutions, recognizing that the traditional European approach of, of just sort of defending multilateralism and the status quo is not sufficient. There are deep structural problems and the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted those in the World Health Organization, for instance. So really doubling down on also, you know, trying to really reform these institutions will, will, be, will be an important agenda. So balancing autonomy, sovereignty with an assertive forward-leaning multilateral approach, I think will be the key. I, I saw Louise is smiling because of the mention of the World Health Organization. Um, Louise, is there anything on that you want to, to add? No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I have, I have studied the EU's positioning in the World Health Organization for a longer period in time. And I've seen, let's say, the, the, 
the lukewarm positioning of the EU and this organization, taking it for granting, you know, making decisions about details and not about the need to fundamentally reform this organization at a certain point in time. And some of the things that happened, you know, with the World Health Organization, um, yeah, that didn't, didn't surprise me at all. Uh, uh, it's such a weak, underfunded uh, regional structure uh, organization and the EU not having a stronger position on that 10 years ago is something we pay for now uh, dearly. But anyways, that's just... Um, mm -hmm. uh, and in that respect, I think, I guess, also the US administration, you know, and also there were, of course, already behind the scenes talks with the US administration and France and Germany to to see how that could be reformed. Uh, but then when when Trump really pulled out, these these talks were immediately put on hold because I mean you're not going to to talk to continue conversations on reforming an organization if the US just bluntly in the heat of a pandemic uh, steps out. But with Biden that opens uh, definitely opportunity. But um, okay, so so there's there's agreement among the panelists that Europe should be more say assertive, should develop a more coherent external profile, should be strategically autonomous in a number of areas. But that raises the obvious question of okay, how do we do that? And um, there's been talk, for instance, in terms of strengthening uh, the ability of the EU to take action in foreign policy terms by moving decision-making from unanimity to qualified majority voting. There are all these plans for developing a new European industrial policy. Um, Eric mentioned this issue of a European investment screening system. Um, but are we, are we delivering? Are we getting there? Because we also know some of the internal divisions inside the EU. And I, I want to use this opportunity to ask Lisa to sort of give her assessment about, okay, how do we get to that apparently shared ambition to make a more resolute, more ambitious, more assertive EU on the international stage? Well, thank you, Rem. I think what I see basically are, are three lines of work. And I don't say that we get the results immediately, but the three lines of work is first, and you mentioned a few, like, for example, increasing uh, uh, the possibilities to reach uh, an agreement, like introducing qualified majority voting, for example. So that is the line of the improve, improving of the effectiveness of the common foreign and security policy. And there are very pragmatic uh, proposals that we put on the table, like, for example, introducing QMV, but also uh, making sure that the high representative have, has more uh, margins of maneuver to make statements and react quickly to situations, especially when we do have a, a policy that is set, uh, but also when it comes to the agenda setting. I mean, those are very, uh, very concrete proposals that we can work on this effectiveness. But then we have the reinforcement, the second policy line is the reinforcement of the common security and defense policy. Uh, and there we see that this has to go hand in hand with reinforcing NATO. And of course, I mean, it's not a new concept of the single set of forces. I mean, we have one single set of forces that we're going to deploy either in NATO or either in uh, EU. For us, it's very important if we develop those, uh, the, the European defense capabilities and capacities, um, that uh, we work on what Europe uh, does best. Um, and it's also, I mean, we have the PESCO, like the, 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 the reinforced cooperation structures, but we also think that it's important to have an open structure where third countries can join in, especially now with Brexit. It is, it is for us important to be able to mobilize. Uh, and I liked what uh, Eric said about the moral leadership. And I think we can do things we're good in training where I mean there are things that we can do um, but we see that also going hand in hand with NATO we should not be in competition but it should be com complementary and the third uh, line of work and that's where the strategic autonomy comes in and that's I think the hardest hard work and the unsexy part um, and it's what I call the small, geopolit ge small uh, geopolitics and it's about policy coherence uh, because there's no international uh, organization or international cooperation structures that have has as many uh, tools in its toolkit as a national as like a country 
So when you look at what the EU can bring to the table, it's mainly in the economic domain. And, and Eric said that very, very eloquently. Uh, so we are um, a, a major economic power. So when you look at that, it comes into, I mean, but it, we, we can bring to the table our economic power, but it brings us to questions of weighing security with competitiveness, weighing security with protectionism, uh, with innovation. Uh, and that's where the different, um, where the difficult questions come in. And that's why we need a and like a new structure, uh, bringing together the competences of the European Commission, the member states and the EES. I mean, we created the, the, the external action service with the three hat, uh, the triple hatted approach, bringing in the member states, uh, the rotating presidency, the commission um, and, um, uh, and the, the council. Uh, but we see now that it's very difficult for them to play that role linking together like for example, the industrial policy, when it comes together to, with competitiveness uh, decisions, um, how to weigh those things. We need to bring them together. You need the council, you need the member states to do that, uh, to weigh those political uh, differences. Having said all that, I mean, because, and I agree with Eric that we have to look very cl closely at our um, innovation. And this is something the Netherlands is pushing very, very hard. At the same time, if, if, if we manage to have policy coherence, taking into account the fact that others might use economy for their geopolitical goals, and if we really want to respond to that, I think that we would be surprised how much we could mobilize. I'm not sure that everybody would like the answers. And I'm not even sure the US would like those answers. Um, because if you look, for example, at the Green Deal, or when you look at the digital agenda, I think when it comes to um, norm setting agendas, and this is, I think, something that the EU is pretty good at, and I think that this is also something that is expected from us and also something to, to stay ahead of the curve. So if we look at the Green Deal, for example, it is a major opportunity to set standards for a greener economy. Uh, but for example, I mean, we have discussions, I mean, this is just a discussion stage about the carbon border adjustment mechanism, for example. If Joe Biden were to be elected, I think that this is something we might be able to work on with the US together, like design a system where you can manage the, the effects. If Donald Trump were to be elected, I, I don't think that's a real chance to happen very soon. Uh, but also when you look at, for example, the digital agenda, um, when you look at the ideas, I mean, they're just ideas, but it's longer term, like music for the future, uh, about the technological um, uh, taxes. I'm not sure with the tech giants in the US, this is an answer, European answer, standing on its own feet that the US would appreciate. Um, so I, I think that this is a domain that is um, a domain that we need to explore, but it is it is very I mean it's full of risks and <laughs> and I think coming back to my first point, for us the strategic uh, partnership with the U.S. is very important. So if we want to move ahead, it's also important to keep keep this conversation open and to see what the answers are to the global problems that we define. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I mean, the, the, the point you raise about policy coherence is obviously the, the crucial one inside the EU. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's also one of the most complicated ones because it touches upon national interests. Um, in a minute, I want to look at, okay, what does all this mean for the Netherlands? But I also want to bring in Eric's perspective because I know that you know the Nordic countries in the EU quite well, Eric. And I'm just curious, how is this debate about strategic autonomy or even you know, in, industrial in industrial policy terms, this flirt with European champions being, being perceived in um, say Stockholm or, um, or elsewhere in, the, in, in Scandinavia? 
Sure. Well, I think it's a good example of an area where Europe is actually quite, you know, divided. Um, you know, we, we talked about divisions of foreign policy. I think there are different uh, visions of, you know, the future direction of the EU, even in some of these fields. Um, and of course, of course, you know, Northern Europe has traditionally been sort of, you know, more internationalist oriented, more free trade oriented, um, more skeptical of protectionism and industrial policy. I do think to some extent that is changing. It's changing because of Brexit. It's changing because of you know, Trump's economic nationalist agenda, and because of the need to address real challenges stemming especially from, from China. Um, so I do think, you know, th there is a shift here and we have seen countries move, uh, but this debate is still very much playing out. And I think what, you know, if you talk to policymakers in Stockholm or in Copenhagen or Helsinki, what they would tell you is, you know, we need to balance, yes, doing more to kind of support Europe, Europe first, it was said, but also making sure that we do other things that are maybe less sexy, but ultimately equally important. Um, you know, finishing the di digital single market, strengthening the capitals union, making sure that we have access to, to venture capital and investments so we can, so we can you know, innovate and keep companies in Europe, improving the business environment, the sort of digital ecosystem. So balancing, I think, this sort of more open agenda, more innovation prone agenda with the, the more sort of, um, if you want to call it protectionist agenda, uh, but I do think it's changing. And, and I think if you're listening to certainly what's coming out of Brussels from the European Commission, I think in some ways this sort of francophone view of, of some of these issues seems to have gained a lot of hold and seems to be galvanizing at least the European institutions, forcing even those member states on the fringe that are a bit more skeptical to adjust. And I think that's what we're seeing playing out, uh, including from, from some of the countries in, in nor the Northern part of Europe. Great, okay, more questions. Um, Brigitte. Yes, uh, maybe to move back from the European level to the multilateral level. Um, we have a question from the Irish ambassador, Kevin uh, Kelly. Uh, does the panel think that just a slim and narrow victory by Biden, if that happens, uh, will cause a retreat from some of the foreign policy commitments made by candidate Biden, uh, with in mind a fear of a backlash in four years time uh, from an over enthusiastic return to the embrace of multilateralism? Mm. Um, Interesting. Can um, Louisa, do you want to take a stab at that? Uh, again, I know that you've been working on this issue of the future of multilateralism. How do you see a somewhat, let's say, a, a handicapped President Biden in this context? Yeah, Ren, we're actually working on this paper for the European Parliament for an Affairs Committee, and I'm doing the parts on, on climate, health and international order, which are indeed exactly the issues where we expect this huge difference, you know, between Biden and, and Trump. So it's very difficult now to, to write on it. That being said, I don't think it will be the first priority of Biden, uh, because again, as also other speakers have pointed out, the country is so divided, there is so much of a dom domestic agenda, and also, um, yeah, you need also some backing, you know, from the from the Congress, uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, for international treaties, you need usually a two thirds majority. Well, that's far out of sight. Um, so I think I do think yes, he will rejoin the Paris Agreement. He will rejoin the World Health Organization. He will uh, look at the World Trade Organization in a different way. Um, so there's definitely a lot of opportunities for multilateralism and, and recovery of multilateral institutions. Uh, um, but I also think it will not be his first priority and it will not uh, be probably that uh, quick, fast and not, uh, not so strong. So it will, will still be uh, relying a lot on, on other countries, Europeans with like-minded, maybe also with new alliances. Um, uh, I've been thinking a lot lately about EU-India relations that I, I think will be reinvigorated. Um, um, we both will not uh, want, let's say, a UN with Chinese uh, characteristics. Um, so I think there will be more cooperation between the EU and the US in, in case Biden wins uh, on, you know, uh, avoiding um, let's say that the, 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 the Chinese in top positions of international organizations, um, uh, the community of common destiny, perhaps not the, um, uh, perhaps not the um, uh, human rights angle. Uh, in any case, I think we seriously would need to discuss with the US administration how to deal with the Human Rights Council, uh, its, it's, it's, uh, its, mem its current membership. 
Um, so there's a lot of issues to address on the multilateral uh, scene, but where probably it's not the first priority. I think it's also super important that the G7 and the G20 sometimes forgotten here in the Netherlands because we're not direct part of it, but the glue basically of the international system has been very absent in the pandemic recovery, the economic recovery, coordination. Um, so I definitely also hope that in G7, G5, G20, uh, uh, a revival of the talks will emerge. Um, Lisa or Eric, do you want to come in on, uh, on this point? I'll just offer a few words, if I may. Um, I, I do think, I agree with Luis. I, I do think Biden would be certainly more in favor of multilateralism than Trump. Trump would continue uh, the US disengagement from the multilateral institutions in favor of this transactional bilateral approach. Uh, but I don't think Biden um, would sort of wholeheartedly just embrace uh, multilateralism as such. I think he would still look at it through quite a transactional lens. Um, I do think uh, Luis is right. He would focus on building coalitions of countries um, to tackle specific problems. I think you would see much more uh, emphasis on these kind of bespoke groups, certainly the G7, there's been talk about a D10, uh, this notion that you can gather uh, a summit of democracies, for instance. So those type of initiatives I would look for. But at the same time, I also do think that at least on two issues, global health and climate, you would see the US re-engage at the multilateral level and under Biden administration, probably even engage Beijing, which of course are issues that Trump has taken the US out of. So I do think, you know, from a European perspective, it, that would sort of mirror quite well the European approach of viewing China as a systemic you know, rival, as the, as the EU calls it, a partner and a competitor, that you could, you could pursue all these different tracks at the same time. And that could be, I think, on both of those areas, global health and climate would be areas where the US and the EU can not just work together but, uh, with each other, but work also jointly on approaching China on those issues. And that would be, I think, really, really significant. Right. Um... I mean, you mentioned China. Uh, I, I want to take um, a minute to dwell upon the sort of the China-US-EU triangle of, well, I don't know what kind of triangle it is. Um, I mean, how, how should we move look at that in the context of what we've just discussed about strategic autonomy, about some of the problems we face in terms of multilateralism? Uh, the role of the United States. We know that the United States and the EU have set up this dialogue on China. We've also, I think, reached agreement that the United States is going to be quite inward looking. Um, if on China, if I want to, if I offer my own um, assessment, the US is going to expect Europe to do, to, to basically follow the US lead more, but Europe wants its own voice on China. I mean, Lisa, is this something that, um, that I can ask you to, to, to reflect on? Well, this is of course something that I, I started my, my intervention with because I think it is the key uh, to, I mean, how we are going to develop as a European Union, like the rivalry between the US and China that is going to intensify. Um, and there will be a lot of pressure from both sides, I think in, in different shapes and forms, but, uh, and of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, expect a par expects a partnership, uh, and uh, and at the same time, uh, the China expect us to work with them on the Belt and Road and so forth. So it, it, there will be a lot of pressure on us. For us, I think that's where um, it's that's why it's so important now to look at this question of strategic autonomy. Uh, about and to look at resilience of the European Union against all of those pressures, but also making sure that, I mean, like the COVID uh, pandemic showed us very much how much we were uh, dependent on, on Chinese medical uh, supplies, for example. Um, and that we also experienced that sometimes um, these supplies were uh, either granted or, or kept in a, in a harbor some, somewhere if, if it was at the willing of the, the Chinese uh, government. So we, we also, it was a wake up call uh, to, to see, um, for us to understand that it is important to have uh, a balance in interests and, and dependencies. And I think that only then we can become a player when we, when we have, for example, when our dependencies are not as big uh, as they are right now. Uh, <clears throat> so this is very much what we have to, to look for, while at the same time not recurring to protectionist uh, reactions. I mean, 
one of the things is, is when it comes to strategic autonomy that you have to look very much at supply chains, for example. It's not, it's not a problem uh, if products are Chinese, for example. It is, uh, it is a problem if there are certain fragilities that come with the supply chain or that are part of the supply chain. So that's what we would like to do is, and that's why, uh, if, and then I recognize what Eric said about the divergences within the European Union, look at ways at looking at these dependencies. What we would like to do is to find ways to respond in a, in a, uh, a precise way to the threats to our strategic autonomy, not having like big uh, tariff uh, walls or having like blunt instruments or protectionist instruments or state big state aid programs because we think that would limit our, our, um, our innovation power. But what we do need to, to do is to look very carefully where the risks are and where the imbalances are and address those. And there can be different types of uh, reactions to that. For example, the Netherlands has taken earlier this year an initiative to, that was picked up by the commission to address um, Full's uh, <coughs> market distortion uh, with um, state aid by third countries, for example. So we're looking at those specific things and try to address those, losing our naivety, <laughs> uh, but at the same time focusing on an open system, uh, but uh, lowering our dependency. And only then, and with this forward-looking agenda, and I think we are very well on track if we really go ahead with the Green Deal and the digital agenda and the other tracks that I mentioned, I think we do stand a chance to be less dependent and, uh, and, and at the same time be a partner for both. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's also key that and we see some of that actually coming out of the polling that we did recently at the Klingendal Institute that there is not really an appetite among at least the Dutch population to want to have to choose sides uh, between the US and China. Um, I'm just with an eye on the clock. I think we have time for one last question and I can bring all, all three of you in on that. Um, Brigitte. There are still many more questions um, ranging uh -huh. from Russia, the Western Balkan, uh, the, uh, the leak of democracies and Mm, but I think one question that's, that summarizes all those questions, uh, but also where you can all give your, your views on, is uh, one question from Norman Schulz. And it is, uh, was the Trump administration's approach to foreign policy a complete failure, or did he also did something good in the last four years? Maybe wanted or unwanted. So, for example, the China policy, Middle East, the spur on European sovereignty. Um, yeah, Rem, back so to you. So, if I understand it correctly, kind of what the the unintended or perhaps the intended positive effects of, uh, of US foreign policy over the past four years have been um, possibly particularly from a European angle. Um, Louisa, can I ask you to go first and then we'll go in reverse order. Yeah, what I've seen in my research is, you know, the Americans rally around the flag if, if a US president starts a war. Uh, the Europeans rally around Europe if, uh, a U.S. president is behaving internationally in uh, a bit a blunt or, 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 or ways that we don't like. And we saw that with Bush when he pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol and the International Criminal Court. And that's also what we have seen in the past years. So my uh, positive take on four years of Trump uh, so far has been that it has really enabled the EU to uh, unite more strongly and to think about its own interests in foreign policy. Great. Um, Lisa. Um, yeah, this is a very difficult question <laughs> for me. Um, I, I think that um, uh, if you look at the foreign policy agenda of Trump, um, I think um, the one thing that has surprised us, for example, was his take on um, alliances and partnerships. Uh, and I think that uh, that sometimes made us feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, and also the, the take on multilateral cooperation. Uh, and I think that in our view, we could have um, worked in a different way, in a different style. And uh, at, at the end, it is very important to note that the cooperation has continued. I mean, it's not that, I mean, sometimes we would have liked a different tone, tone of voice, but 
the cooperation, like for example, within NATO has been uh, as strong as ever. Um, when you look at, for example, the, the trade balance uh, issue with China, um, what that uh, Donald Trump picked up, um, there was a distorted trade balance. And uh, this was uh, like looking at the broader uh, issue of the US-China uh, relations, something to deal with. And he did that. And I'm not sure if, if, if it is in a way that I would have done it <laughs> personally, but, but it is something that was uh, there to do something with. And he did that. Um, and the other thing that came to my mind, he didn't start any new wars. Uh, I think that is also an interesting uh, foreign policy uh, uh, fact. Um, so, so if I look look at that, I, I think it is more like what we started out with: the question of tone uh, than a question of whether the acts were actually uh, wrong or not. Thanks. Um, uh, before I give Eric the floor, just one um, footnote to the comment regarding Trump's focus on trade balances. He had a focus on the trade balance or the trade deficit with. Uh, with China, but I saw some recent figures this morning and that in four years time, even though there was this focus on it, it, it the, the trade balance has hardly, has hardly shifted. Um, uh, Eric. Sure, just very quickly. I mean, I would say that a lot of Trump's analysis of the problem are, were actually quite spot on. I mean, China's unfair economic policies, Iran's destabilizing regional role, the need to sort of, you know, re reform multilateral institutions. Um, I think his assessment of the problems were, were pretty spot on. His solutions, however, I think have been to large part misguided and frankly counterproductive, both from a US and a European point of view, um, slapping tariffs on allies, you know, undermining alliances, um, pulling the U.S. out instead of ac actively engaging in reforming some of those institutions, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I think ultimately um, the the assessments were, were were sometimes better than the actual solutions pursued. Um, and where that leaves Europe is, I'm not so sure that it actually. I think four four years into Trump, you know, I think the jury's still out whether Trump is uniting or dividing Europe. I see, I see. It pulling both ways. And I think if we get four more years, um, you know, I do think there's a need for Europe then to really step up on strategic autonomy and all that. I'm not so sure. And I actually see member states still being quite divided and perhaps, you know, a second Trump administration will divide Europe even more. So I think there would be a need uh, to really sort of try to come together. And here, my last point would be, you know, we talk about the EU. I think we also need to talk about Europe. And I think we need to talk about bringing in the UK because regardless of what happens, uh, the UK is still a major power in Europe, militarily, politically, politically, uh, economically, and we need to find ways post-Brexit of, of trying to bring them back in, whether it's a formal kind of UK EU arrangement or some kind of bespoke way. But I would like to see that because I think that will, that will really help address problems both in Europe's neighborhood, but also some of these global challenges that despite Brexit, you know, London and, and Europe, European capitals on the continent still basically share a very similar outlook and quite distinct from, from Trump. And I think under Biden, uh, were he to become president, this could really be an opportunity, I think, to also try to heal that wound in Europe that Brexit has caused, try to bring countries together, encourage them to do more, um, and maybe revert some of the negative uh, approaches that Trump has taken to, to actually fix the problems that Trump identified. I knew somehow our conversation would gravitate towards Brexit at some point. So thanks for that, Eric. And I, I, to be honest, I couldn't agree with you more about the necessity to heal that, uh, to heal that relationship. Um, Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so what I'm going to do is to give you my great thanks for your comments, your insights, and for your willingness to spend some time with us. Uh, so Lise Grégoire van Haar, thank you very much. Eric Bradford from Washington, DC, you deserve another espresso. Um, Louise, uh, always great to have you in, uh, in, our, in our conversations. And Brigitte, you've been a, 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 a fantastic co-host. I do apologize for all those that asked questions that we didn't get around to. Fortunately, um, this is not the first and it's definitely not the last time that we're going to be hosting conversations at Klingendal about the future of the transatlantic relationship, strategic autonomy, uh, the future of multilateralism. So I do invite you to join us again. Um, and with that, uh, allow me to uh, say Big thank you to all those who uh, who listened in and uh, uh, online. And now we can go back to uh, watching the U.S. election results. Take care, everyone.